Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, July 14th, 2021. And today in history, July 14th, 1798, former President John Adams signed the Sedition Act. This is the last of the four Alien and Sedition Acts into law. This is one of the worst violations of the Constitution in history. Just right out of the gates, just years after ratifying the Bill of Rights, they're criminalizing free speech and freedom of the press on a national level. So on this episode, I've got a bit of an overview of what they passed, a few examples of what they considered sedition and even speech printed in the press that counted as insurrection. And I've got a response, of course, from Kentucky and Virginia, a little bit of that. And if you find all this interesting, at least three to four other episodes, I've covered a lot on this in different directions for you to check about check on later. I'll recommend those near the end of the show. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 930 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow this program, all the archives for about three years now. Individual episodes like this one, I'm going to link to articles and original source documents, all kinds of stuff so you can read and learn more on your own time. And of course, I've got those extra episodes, three to four episodes for you to check out as well. You've got all the different platforms where we live stream on mainstream video ones like Facebook and YouTube and Twitch and uh, Twitter. We're also on a bunch of other platforms that we encourage people to check out. Minds.com, Library.tv, Odyssey.com, Gab TV, MeWe, Brighty on BitChute. We're all over the place. We want to be outside the mainstream control as much as possible. In case you've noticed that we're gone from one of those mainstream platforms suddenly, especially if we're talking about freedom of speech here, Let's uh, keep in mind that we might have to look elsewhere in the near future. We're also on the podcast edition. We have the podcast edition on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and all the rest. And you can even find our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. Again, the show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. I'm going to say a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat before I get into all the details here. <laughs> Great comment from Blue North Wind over on YouTube. Michael sounds like he's been practicing his speed talking. I'm a little amped up because I've got an HVAC problem here at home. I'm trying to keep the uh, air conditioning rolling, uh, but that's probably a, a good to see you here. There's Melody Skamen, Irwin, Dixie Strong, Jim Kirkendall. Good to see you as well, buddy. Uh, Murray Ray, Ravioli, Clay Kent, Dwayne and Tim Martin, and everyone else. I appreciate you spending some time with me. I apologize if I missed anybody, but let's get right to this. And I want to start out with the blog that I published originally in 2014, maybe even earlier. There was an earlier version of it and then updated it throughout the years, but here's how it started. No protesting the government? No freedom of the press? Lawmakers jailed? Is this the story of the Soviet Union during the Cold War? That's what you'd expect. No, it describes the United States in 1798 after passage of the Sedition Act. One of a series of four laws signed in June and July that year. Well, maybe sedition wasn't the last one. I got to look at my details on this. I thought sedition was the last one. Maybe it's May and June. Known collectively as the Alien and Sedition Acts. We know for sure the Sedition Act was signed Ju July 14th, 1798. History.com, I'm surprised to see this. They describe it this way. It, is one of, it was one of the most egregious breaches of the U.S. Constitution in history and became federal law when Congress passes the Sedition Act. Well, it became law when it was signed, endangering liberty in the fragile new nation. While the United States engaged in naval hostilities with revolutionary France, known as the Quasi-War, Alexander Hamilton and congressional federalists took advantage of the public's wartime fears 
and drafted and passed the Alien and Sedition Acts without first consulting President John Adams. I'm not sure if he wasn't involved in the process. He did sign it into law, so he was consulted at some point, when, even if they never spoke to him and he had no idea this was coming, according to History.com, and I'm not sure if that's even correct, but even if he had no idea, it got to his desk and he was consulted there and he didn't respond with his consultation of a veto. Here from the history section, the history archives of the U.S. House of Representatives. Notice the how history.com, I think they're actually correct when they're talking about they took advantage of the public's wartime fears. And I'm going to get to more of that in just a moment. Here, the Fifth Congress, narrowly divided between the majority Federalists and the minority Jeffersonian Republicans, voted 44 to 41 in favor of the Senate pass bill. I'm not sure of the vote in the Senate, but I know it was pretty close there as well. Federalist championed championing the legislation, fearing, again, fear, fearing impending war with France and out of the desire to hold the majority in Congress and to retain the White House, then occupied by Federalist John Adams. Federalist, again, here's from Gilder Lehrman Institute. Federalists believe that the Sedition Act was necessary for the security of the United States during this undeclared quasi-war. Again, it's about war and fear of war and fear of being conquered. They feared, again, that criticism from Democratic Republicans and in, the, in, in newspapers such as the Aurora, I'm going to get to a quote from the Aurora in just a little bit, would undermine the government. They were concerned that newspapers or publication freedom of speech was going to undermine their power, maybe even their war plans. I don't think Adams was fully on board with what they all wanted to do, but he certainly was signing this stuff into law. Now, remember, and I'm wearing the T-shirt for those of you watching, one of my favorite quotes ever really comes from John Adams himself. I think John Adams was one of the good guys early on. He was the Atlas of Independence. He did a lot of great writing, a lot of great speeches, a lot of great work early on, but he transitioned. And I think this might be one of those examples of how power corrupts. And once someone gets in office, you shouldn't trust anyone with power. Trust no man living with power to endanger the public liberty was John Adams' own words. But my favorite, one of my favorite quotes, maybe this is my favorite of his, he said, fear, this is in 1776, fear is the foundation of most governments. And you know, if you listen to me talk about this, I only want to change one thing from that to totally agree with it, and that's remove the word most. And we heard from History.com, from the U.S. House of Representatives, History, from the Gilder Lehrman Institute, over and over we're talking about fear. Fear of the French, fear that publication criticism, fear of criticism in newspapers like the Aurora, fear would create a problem that would undermine the power, the goals of the central government. We have a lot of that today. They fear information getting out. It's much harder for them to shut it down than it is than it was back then because it's much more free flowing. We have much more uh, alternative. We have more opportunities to share information. We know that they used basically cancel culture during the ratification debates over the Constitution in Pennsylvania. The Federalist majority literally silenced any publication of the opposition anti-Federalists. These are both terms of art, but they silenced it and they almost ended up losing ratification because word got out about that very early on in Pennsylvania in late 1787 and they didn't want to repeat that mistake, but only not because it was a bad idea to pressure the newspapers or the publications to not run the opposition view, but because they were concerned about losing. And here we are a few years later, the Federalists again are doing the same thing. They have fear of publishing things, undermining the government. Now, I did a whole episode covering John Adams's shift from revolutionary, the Atlas of Independence, to a monarchist. And that's how Mercy Otis Warren described him later on. I will link to that episode in the show notes in case you're interested in that transition by John Adams. Now, let's go a little bit further. Uh, some of the debate covered things like this. And here's a guy named John Allen of Connecticut. This is in the House of Representatives. He's citing, he's concerned about, you know, seditious statements against the government, undermining insurrection even. And he cites the Aurora on the House floor. He says, in the Aurora, last Tuesday, we find this paragraph. And this is what they consider dangerous. Quote, where a law shall have been passed in violation of the Constitution making it criminal to expose the crimes, the official vices or abuses, or the attempts of men in power to usurp 
a despotic authority, is there any alternative between an abandonment, abandonment of the Constitution and resistance? That's what they published. Mind you, over and over and over, maybe John Allen was an idiot, maybe John Allen didn't care, but over and over, during the debates over ratification in the state ratifying convention, we heard Federalists and Anti-Federalists alike refer to the term resistance. James Iredell, who was... He may have been on the Supreme Court at this point. I'm not sure, actually. But he ended up on the Supreme Court, nominated by George Washington. He should have been there at this point. He said in the North Carolina ratifying convention that when the government usurps power, the people will resist. So the term resistance, uh, Theophilus Parsons said anyone is justified in their resistance when Congress goes beyond the limits of their authority. These are advocates of the Constitution, the same Federalists that John Allen is part of some years later. So he's complaining that, oh, wow, now they're publishing in the Aurora that they're, the, we have to resist a law that usurps the Constitution. This is an opinion piece. He says he declares what is unconstitutional. How dare he even say that? And then invites people to, quote, resistance. He's really highlighting this term resistance, the fact that they would publish such a thing, encouraging people to resist an act of the government. He says this is an awful, horrible example of the liberty of opinion and freedom of the press. Can gentlemen hear these things and lie quietly on their pillows? I mean, if these guys heard the type of stuff we hear today, they'd think everything was an insurrection. He says such liberty of the press and of opinion is calculated to destroy all confidence between man and man. It leads to a dis dissolution of every bond of union. It cuts asunder every ligament that unites man to his family, man to his neighbor, man to society and to government. I mean, this dramatic garbage. But, I mean, it passed 44 to 41. This wasn't too controversial. I mean, he was probably the most extreme. I will link to, you could read the full debates. I think he was the most extreme in his views, but maybe some people were holding back a little bit. There are other pretty juicy statements as well. He says, God deliver us from such liberty, the liberty of vomit vomiting on the public floods of falsehood and hatred to everything sacred, human, and divine. Vomiting on the public floods is literally publishing one paragraph that says when they usurp the Constitution, when they usurp power, this act violates the Constitution, declare something, an opinion that something is unconstitutional, and then calls people to resist it. That is vomiting. It is falsehood and hatred to everything sacred, human, and divine. So I think even though at some perspective, even though things are pretty bad today, uh, this maybe isn't the necessarily, it may not be as bad as it was. They have more technological capabilities, but what they considered crossing the line back then, surprisingly, was far less than today. Here's a link, and I will include this in the show notes at 10th Amendment Center .com slash path to liberty. The history of Congress, uh, I've got a direct link. There's about eight, 10 pages, I think. It starts with punishment of crime if you're following along, and you can read through that and check it out for more info. Going a little further, here's the full text, section two of the act. I'm just going to read some of this. It's kind of boring. Maybe I'll skip over some pieces, but I've got it highlighted here. And I will, of course, link to it in the show notes in case you want to read it. It's a couple of pages. It's two pages is this act. The first section literally says it's unlawful to oppose uh, any measure or measures of the government. <laughs> like This is just criminalizing resistance. What the advocates of the Constitution told the people they needed to do if the people thought the government was going to violate the Constitution. Well, and then section two, be it further enacted that if any person shall write, print, utter, or publish, publish, or cause, or procure to be written, printed, uttered, or published, or shall knowingly and willingly assist or aid in writing, printing, uttering or publishing any false, scandalous, and malicious writing, or, so it sounds like they're just going after libel, but even Thomas Jefferson, and I'm not going to get into details on that, Jefferson says that's a state issue. This is not a federal issue. The federal government isn't delegated a power to deal with that particular crime, and even in the Kentucky Resolutions, his draft for the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798, he points out that the Constitution lists only a handful of crimes that can be federal crimes. Everything else is a state issue. 
So they say, okay, it looks like they're just trying to go after false or scandalous stuff, but anyone who even assists in uttering, I mean, does that mean inviting someone into your home and if they say something and they get reported on by the Stasi? That is really the type of language that the Stalinists would have used, certainly. I, mean, I wish I had a comparison to maybe something that was passed by the Soviet Union. Maybe they didn't need one like that on the books. Maybe they did. I don't know. But so they've got that false section. And then they say, or writings against the government of the United States or either a house of the Congress of the United States or the president of the United States with intent to defame the said government or either house of said Congress or the said president or to bring them or either of them into contempt or disrepute, literally saying, uttering, publishing, helping doing any of those things that would bring any member of the federal government except the vice president, which was Thomas Jefferson from the opposing party. They specifically excluded Thomas Jefferson from this. You could defame, you could bring him into contempt or disrepute, but literally just saying the president is garbage. And I've got actually a simpler example coming up for someone who was convicted of, say, publishing something against the president at the time. That was considered a crime, and it was a pretty hefty one as well. Or the excite against them, or either any of them, the hatred of the good people of the United States. If they hate a politician, and I think we should really hate most of them, maybe uh, maybe hate's a strong word, but uh, something along those lines. Or to stir up sedition within the United States, or to excite any unlawful combination thereof, therein for opposing or resisting any law of the United States or any act, any act of the President of the United States done in pursuance of any such law. So basically anything that isn't full compliance and speaking in full compliance. It's almost like Chinese communists control the Great Firewall, things like that. And the punishment was a fine not exceeding $2,000 in 1798. And I don't know the calculation. I would guess, maybe someone out in the live chat knows, I would guess the calculation is somewhere between 40 and 50 grand minimum today. But mind you, this is a that was sound money back then. They're just printing the cash out of thin air today. $2,000 and two years in prison. Now, it they added a clause that got it passed that it was going to sunset in March of 1801. Now, people weren't really certain that it was going to really sunset because they wanted to get a re-election. This was John Adams's first term. And we didn't know at that point when they passed that he would eventually lose very close uh, battle to Thomas Jefferson, who just let it sunset. One of the reasons he lost really turns out was passage of this act, the series of Alien Sedition Acts. Here's from an article by Mike Meharry that we published back in 2017. The Alien and Sedition Acts outraged many people in Kentucky. Kentucky was a hotbed of resistance or opposition to this. Several counties in the Commonwealth adopted resolutions condemning the acts, including, and I'm going to butcher these names, and I apologize, Kentucky and people in the South, but I can't get it right. I'm going to try. Fayette? Fayette? Clark? Bourbon, Madison, and Woodford counties adopted resolutions opposing this. Now, if you've heard me talk about so-called sanctuary resolutions on the Second Amendment today, I generally oppose resolutions because they claim to be something that they're not. But resolutions are a very local level resolutions are a very important part of a movement to resist and reject federal power. It just has to be framed for what it is, a non-binding statement of opinion used to generate further opposition up the food chain a little bit on the state level so that the state can do something as well. Now, there are some times where localities can actually do something, but when they pass a non-binding resolution and claim that it's more than it is, that's not good. Here in Kentucky in 1798, they passed resolutions really just encouraging resistance and opposition, encouraging the legislature in the Commonwealth to do something about it. About it. But here, a Madison County militia, Madison County, Kentucky militia regiment, Mike writes, issued an ominous resolution of its own stating, quote, the alien and sedition bills are an infringement of the Constitution and of natural rights and that we cannot approve or submit to them. So that's a warning. And it's a very similar warning to the Declaration of Resolves of the First Continental Congress, I believe late 1774, they listed a bunch of stuff that Parliament had done, and they said, to these acts, 
we cannot submit. It was a non-binding resolution, but it was letting the far off government know that they were going to take further action. This is the same type of revolutionary strategy that they used in Kentucky in 1798, literally repeating the strategy of the years leading up to the revolution, passing similar resolutions saying, we're not, this is a problem, this is why, and we cannot submit to this, just be warned. Mike goes on, he says, several thousand people gathered at an outdoor meeting protesting the acts in Lexington on August 13th. We don't see that kind of opposition to restrictions on just about anything today, but that's a, that's a positive thing. Several thousand people at the time was a pretty big deal. Now, Thomas Jefferson in November, early November, I think on the 3rd, let me see, November 3rd, 1798, he sent a letter to James Madison about this. Now, there's a lot of our letters between Madison and Jefferson. There certainly were less after passage of the Alien and Sedition Acts. I think they knew that the mail was being monitored and they were concerned. But he points out, he says, yesterday's papers bring us an account of Lyon of Vermont being indicted before Judge Patterson under the Sedition Act. People were prosecuted. From my understanding, Matthew Lyon, who was a sitting congressman, he was in the House of Representatives, he was indicted and actually convicted under the Sedition Act. And what for? This is it. He had accused President Adams of, and this isn't in, in Jefferson's writing, he was just noting to James Madison, assuming that the papers were not publishing about that. In fact, he actually said that possibly your papers may not mention the issues. He was found guilty and found fined $1,000 and a judge to four months imprisonment for what? And this is just in the notes over at founders.archive.gov. He had called President Adams, among other things, in a public letter, quote, an unbounded thirst for ridiculous pomp, foolish adulation, and selfish avarice. Literally just said, this guy is just pomp and circumstance. He's really kind of kingly in his approach. He's a bad guy. And he, a sitting congressman, was imprisoned and fined. I guess that would have been 20, 30,000 at the time. And four months in prison while he was in Congress, he actually won re-election, I believe, from prison as well. That's how unpopular this was. I guess they did not judge the politics of how this was going to play out too well. So that's a pretty interesting example. In the official case of U.S. versus Matthew Lyon, the author wrote that Lyon was, quote, this is in the official case file, he was being a malicious and seditious person and of a depraved mind and wicked and diabolical disposition and deceitfully and wickedly and maliciously contrived to defame the government of the United States and with intent to design to defame the said government of the United States and John Adams, the president, into contempt and disrepute. Again, they use that legal language. They use the exact words. They brought him into disrepute. He said he had ridiculous pomp. That brings him into disrepute. This is a very, this is definitely King George repeated. This mentality that the head, the presider, the president should be basically treated with, uh, you know, kid gloves. You can't say anything bad about him or you're going to go to jail, even if you're in Congress. And with intent to design and excite against the said government, the hatred of the good people of the U.S. and to stir up sedition in the United States. So he was convicted and there were a number of others. They closed newspapers, for example. This was an aggressive attack on freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Now we know, of course, and I'm not going to get into too much detail, that in response to this, Kentucky and Virginia passed the resolutions of 1798 opposing this and really formalizing the principles of nullification and interposition. Here, a little brief bit from Thomas Jefferson's draft, which was uh, sometime before October 4th, 1798. So just in the first six to eight weeks, he already had something written up. I guess there was some uh, question. I think he wanted originally introduced in one area or he was concerned about that. And then they decided to go with Breckenridge to carry the resolution in Kentucky. He writes, resolved that it is now, I, this is what I think is most interesting, because this is clearly an attack on the freedom of the press, freedom of speech, what you can publish, calling things seditious, calling things insurrection for saying things that the founders said that people should do in the first place. This is really bad news. It sounds like a First Amendment violation. They passed the First Amendment. But Jefferson based his argument, of course, and so did James Madison, 
on the Tenth Amendment. He does get into the First Amendment, but he starts out, and here's the third part of the resolution. Resolved, it is true as a general principle and is also expressly declared by one of the amendments to the Constitution, we'll know what it is, that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. He starts out by pointing out, like, look, you can only do the stuff that you've been delegated. That's it. And then he says, no power over the freedom of religion, freedom of speech, or freedom of press being delegated to the United States by the Constitution. So they don't have a power to do anything about this. And I will link to this in the show notes so you can read in full detail. It's long. I'm not going to cover the whole thing here on this episode. But he says, starts out with the 10th Amendment. And then he says, in addition to that, addition to this general principle and express declaration, another and more special provision has been made by one of the amendments to the Constitution, which expressly declares that Congress shall make no law. And then he cites the First Amendment. So he starts out by saying, like, look, you're not delegated to the delegated this power in the first place. And then on top of it, they added a very special restriction just to hammer it home in the First Amendment. They shall make no law. And then they made a law. Here we go again. He says, in addition to this general... Oh, okay, I already got that. He cites the First Amendment, and then he says this. Therefore, the act of the Congress of the U.S. passed on the 14th day of July, 19, 1798, entitled an act, in addition to the act, entitled an act for the punishment of certain crimes against the U.S., that's the Sedition Act, which does abridge the freedom of the press, is not law, but is altogether void and of new, no force. I mean, if they said... If uh, that guy from Connecticut was saying, like, look, just saying that something is unconstitutional and calling for resistance is insurrection. This is not liberty of the press. God save us from this. What did they think of this? They certainly were not fans. That's probably why Thomas Jefferson, the sitting vice president, who you could bring into disrepute, wrote this in secret for Kentucky. James Madison also, as I mentioned, drafted the resolutions for Virginia, which passed uh, finally on Christmas Eve of 1798. And here's just a one piece. Again, he starts out, he starts out talking about that they only have the ability to exercise powers delegated to them. And then he says, this state having by its convention, which ratified the federal constitution, expressly declared. So in their ratification document, they really, really pointed out that they only wanted to ratify as long as they were getting on board with this, that among the other essential rights, the liberty of conscious, conscience and of the press cannot be canceled, abridged, restrained, or modified by any authority of the United States. So he's saying, look, this is the view that we ratified the Constitution under in Virginia, that the, the liberty of the press of conscious, conscience cannot be modified or even restrained in any way by the federal government. They even then, he says, recommended an amendment for that purpose, which was attached to the Constitution or annexed to the Constitution. In Madison's words, he says it would mark a reproachful inconsistency and criminal degeneracy. It, Madison considered it a criminal degeneracy for the state to stand idly by after the state specifically said they are only going to join the union under these terms. And one of those terms was we're only joining when we acknowledge that the federal government cannot in any way modify or restrain the liberty of the press. He says it would be a criminal degeneracy if an indifference were now shown to the most palpable violation of one of the rights thus declared and secured and to the establishment of a precedent which may be fatal to the other. So that's pretty juicy stuff. And to close it out here, I'm not going to get into too much detail on these Kentucky and, Res Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, but I've got a number of other episodes that you can check out. I've got a little bit more detail on the uh, free speech trials, the Sedition Act trials from an episode I did back in September 14th. Uh, so Benjamin Franklin had warned about attacks on free speech. We know all the way back in 1722. So this is a very serious, very long-standing principle and maxim in society 
to many Americans, although there were many people who were more supportive of, uh, I guess, a monarchy at the time still, and they wanted to be able to control that. So I will link to that, C Criminalizing Free Speech, the Sedition Act Trials, which is a brief overview of those. And then I've got some insight on Thomas Jefferson's Kentucky Resolutions of 1798 that I did back in November. And then a third one on James Madison, his strategy and advice on how to de defeat federal programs without relying on the federal government. That includes coverage of his Virginia Resolutions in response to the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. Let me check out the live chat and see if I've got any questions or answers. A quick reminder, if you support the show, you want to help us spread the word, you can smash the like button, leave a comment, get, leave comments, leave reviews on Apple Podcasts, uh, share links, get notifications. All that stuff triggers the algorithm of the platform you watch or listen on, and it tells that platform to show the program to more people. Our membership program starts out as little as two bucks a month over at 10th Amendment Center com slash members. Let me take a look over in the live chat. <laughs> Blue Nar says, crossing my fingers for HVAC. Yeah, I mean, the air conditioner works for about 30 minutes, then we got to drain it. So I, we just have a, we got to have someone come out here and uh, clear a drain, I guess. Pop Basketball says, insightful on how to call out the Fed's unconstitutional acts. Yeah, there's a whole layer of strategy. There's strategy after strategy. And a lot of people think that type of stuff is boring. But we can see how they responded to this in 1798. We can see how they responded to it in 1765 and 1767. And then we can apply that same type of thing today. The founders, actually, when they looked at things on how to do things, on how to advance liberty, they used history as a guide. If this scenario happened and this scenario, this response, happened and you got this result, it was likely to happen that way again if you tried to do the same thing. And that could be on the bad end or the good end of things. Murray Ray says, great show. I appreciate that. Melody Skamen says, thank you. Stay well and stay safe. Much love to all. Uh, taking a look and see if there's any other questions. 2V News, his history tells us any and all government should be considered illegal. I mean... Erwin Havernick says, love to defame the government. Yeah, I mean, back under the Adams administration, you'd be a criminal. They would throw you in jail. They would absolutely go after you, especially if you had some influence. Now, maybe they couldn't go after every person in a tavern. Maybe they couldn't go after everybody that put up a poster. But they certainly warned of that. They certainly want that type of... Of uh, they want that type of insight. They want that type of aggressive enforcement. I'll take a look a little bit through uh, the chat a little bit further today. I read through all the comments. You can also email me, team at 10th Amendment Center .com. I don't get a chance to reply to very many, but I do appreciate the insight. I get tons of ideas for future episodes from your questions, suggestions, and comments. Again, team at 10th Amendment Center .com, or leave comments on whatever platform you happen to watch or listen on. Again, I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned something more than anything, and I'll see you next time here on The Path to Liberty.